in space. Oleg Novitsky is serving as the Soyuz and will serve aboard the International Space Station in July 2014. Assigned to his first space flight as a member of the Expedition 6465 crew, he will serve as a flight engineer aboard Soyuz MS-18 and on the space station. And we're back now with a quick live look inside the capsule. You can see the commander there in the center seat, Oleg Novitsky. And at the top of your screen is Pyotr Dubrov in the left seat today. And just a reminder, a little bit later in the program, we'll be taking your questions. So hop over to at Twitter, use the hashtag AskNASA, and keep sending those in. Continue on, though, uh, something you'll see inside the cabin. Before departing the Gagarin Cosmonaut Training Center in Star City, Russia, the commander, Oleg Novitsky, was able to describe his inspiration for the selection of the crew's zero-G indicator. We have a quick clip of that. For the uh, weightlessness indicator, I do have it with me. This is one of the heroes of our nice cartoon, Kit and Gaff. Yes, it is him. Especially this year, I believe it has been 40 years since this cartoon came out. And, uh, the we are here for the Road Safety World Series. The hotel that we are staying in is a massive hotel. Thankfully, we have a scooter. Let's go for a ride. Hey, come on. Gav Where's the helmet? The I need a helmet. Star of course. Russian animated series from 1976 to 1982 about a Siamese kitten and you will see that floating uh, just in front of uh, the commander's chair right in front of Oleg and we'll see that float once they separate from the third stage of the Soyuz rocket and enter into microgravity. But continuing to get views inside the capsule and of the Soyuz rocket on the launch pad there in Baikonur. We're going to continue to check in on Mark Van de Heij, Oleg Novitsky, and Pyotr Dubrov as they get ready to launch to the International Space Station. And right now we are 41 minutes and 30 seconds away. Uh, launch is time to take place at exactly 2.42 and 41 seconds central. That's 7.42 and 41 seconds GMT, or 12.42 and 41 seconds over in Baikonur. And as I said, we're going to be answering some of your questions. So let's go ahead and start taking a couple of those now. And you can keep sending them in using the hashtag AskNASA. Our first one comes from Kate, who wanted to know, how long can the station provide life support uh, to more than seven astronauts at once? Uh, that's a really great question, Kate. Uh, we don't have a specific amount of time. Uh, this is going to be a handover with 10 people on board, so that does put a little bit more of a strain on your resources, but thankfully we have what we call regenerative life support, so we're able to recycle uh, a lot of the oxygen. We actually generate oxygen uh, from water, which we have more than enough on, on board the space station, and then you have uh, other life support responsible for scrubbing carbon dioxide uh, and also providing drinking water, and we have enough food and other consumables on board uh, to last for several months. And so uh, more than enough on board to, to keep these 10 crew members going for a couple of days. Uh, and also we'll have plenty when we do the Crew 2, Crew 1 handover, where we'll bump all the way up to 11 on board for a couple of days. Uh, our next question comes from Whitney, who said, silly question, but wanted to know how many flight suits do they give you? And do you ever actually use all of those pockets? Happy launch day. Um, it's it's going to differ for the astronauts. They do get a couple, uh, just in case any get damaged or dirty. Um, and I will tell you from personal experience, you do end up using a lot of those pockets. And you also end up forgetting stuff in those pockets, only to find it several months later when you put the flight suit back on. All right, and we'll do one more, at least one more. This one uh, from Chrissy, who wanted to know, what will the sleeping arrangements be on the station with 10 people? And we get this question a lot. Um, so right now we have seven crew quarters, uh, with the kind of the individual sleep stations for crew members on board the space station. We just installed a new one just this week inside of the Columbus module. So with the extra three, they do what's essentially called a camp out. They find 
uh, space in the different modules where they'll set up a temporary spot where they can attach their sleeping bag to the wall um, and they just kind of camp out there for a couple of days. The crew on board works with flight controllers here on the ground to pick those spots um, to give the astronauts as much privacy as possible when they don't have their own crew quarters and it is just temporary. Um, our next one comes from Alejandro, wants to know how much gravity the astronauts have during takeoff. So how many Gs are they pulling? Uh, with the Soyuz, it's a fairly benign ride uphill. Um, they'll pull about three or four Gs at a maximum on the, on the way up, um, primarily once they're under the power of uh, that second and third stage. Um, so not too bad. Uh, they typically pull a little bit more on the way home, uh, but the ride up pretty smooth. Um, with those liquid fuel boosters uh, powering them up the whole way. And we'll go ahead and take one more. This one from Get Well Wickens wants to know, is the Soyuz rocket a one-time use or are there reusable parts? Uh, the rocket itself is a one-time use. It's an expendable. Um, so all of these different rocket parts will either fall to the ground um, in uh, the, the vast expanse of Kazakhstan uh, or in some of the cases like uh, the very upper stage uh, burn up upon re-entry in the Earth's atmosphere. But keep sending those questions. Uh, so now we're giving you some video here. This is from yesterday where a Russian Orthodox priest did the traditional blessing of the rocket. And this is done uh, prior to every single flight a blessing of the rocket, and then it typically will do a blessing of some of the, the pad engineers and some of the other officials, and then moving over to give the media a quick blessing as well. <laughs> Today's activities in Baikonur, though, began several hours ago as the crew was woken up uh, in the Cosmonaut Hotel in Baikonur. There is room here. In a time-honored tradition, as you can see, uh, our commander doing here before departing, the three crew members signed the door of the rooms they occupied at the Cosmonaut Hotel. It's looking good. For Novitsky, this was his third time signing. For Dubrov, his first, as he's the rookie amongst the crew. And then Mark Van Hai about to make his second flight uh, aboard a Soyuz spacecraft and to the International Space Station. This was his second time signing a door inside the Cosmonaut Hotel. They were woken up at about 3.05 a.m. local time uh, over in Baikonur. It was about 5.05 p.m. Uh, Central Time here in Houston, or, or uh, 22.05 GMT. Uh, okay, follow me now. This way. And then just about three hours after waking up, the crew departed the Cosmonaut Hotel. You can see Six flight suits there, so the prime crew in front, the backup crew behind them. It's NASA astronaut Anne McLean, Russian cosmonaut Anton Shkaplerov, and another Russian cosmonaut Oleg Artemyev. The backup crew stays in quarantine with the prime crew throughout their stay uh, in the cosmonaut hotel and their final uh, time in Russia beforehand. And they're with them as they go through their final suit up and rides out to the pad. Again, another time-honored tradition of flying aboard the Soyuz, the Russian Orthodox priest blessing the crew as they make their way out of the hotel and get ready to board a bus and head over to get their suits on. That's enough, enough water. And so after a quick shower, they wave farewell to those that are gathered at the hotel, pose for a few final photos, and then board the bus. And then they are bound for what's known as Building 254, or the Suit Up and Integration Building. The Cosmonaut Hotel on the very edge of the town of Baikonur, uh, just 
outside of the Cosmodrome grounds proper. It's about a 40-minute ride from their hotel out to the suit-up building. Again, all of this happening about three hours after they woke up, about 6.05 in the morning, so an early morning for everybody there in Baikonur. Good morning. Good morning to everyone. This is good. And so once they arrived at the integration and suit up facility, building 254, the crew underwent some final medical exams and then suited up in their Soka launch and entry suits. They're in these throughout all of the dynamic phases of flight, so they're essentially wearing these in their very quick, about three hour and 25 minute journey up to the space station, so they're wearing them now um, all the way until they arrive. And these Soka launch and entry suits are primarily worn if you're familiar with uh, a lot of uh, the different space vehicles, you're wearing these suits uh, during the ride, and they're there to protect you in the event of uh, what's called a cabin depressurization. So if for whatever reason a spacecraft were to lose uh, the integrity of its hull, if the cabin were to go down to vacuum, these suits are connected to breathing air and can pressurize to protect the crew in the event that something like that happens. And that's why we have them wear these throughout all of what we call the dynamic phases, so things like a launch or any time you're rendezvousing, docking, undocking, and then coming home, the crew members will be wearing these suits. The small blue knob you can see right at the top part of the chest is used to adjust the pressure once they go through uh, the inflation or the pressurization of the suit itself. And after they get suited up, and we'll see it in just a moment, uh, each of the crew members goes and gets a quick uh, pressure check or a leak check on these suits. And so we'll be able to see them uh, inflate a bit. But again, for, for Mark Van Heide, this is the second time he's done this exact same process. Again, so after they get the suits on, they move over to get a pressure check just again to make sure that the suit is free from leaks, they each get into basically a mock-up of a Soyuz seat. So what you're looking at is what it looks like once they're inside the capsule itself. They're assisted by suit techs uh, who then connect their suits to a simulated line uh, to pressurize the suit and start flowing breathing air throughout it. And so you'll see once they get locked in, the suits will kind of puff up and that's how you can know that they're pressurized. It's easier to see uh, if you pay attention around the leg area and you'll see everything looks a little bit puffier. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two. Again, the crew goes through this one at a time. Uh, while all this is happening, and we'll see in just a few moments, uh, there's a pane of glass uh, to help maintain that strict quarantine. Uh, that's true for all crew members spending long duration flights on board the space station. Uh, it's not something that we've implemented just in the last year in the current pandemic climate. Uh, a quarantine has been standard for crew members bound for the International Space Station for many years uh, as they're uh, essentially launching into a closed environment uh, and one of the uh, negative effects of living in microgravity for a long time can actually suppress your immune system and so we want to make sure crew members are as healthy as possible not bringing uh, any cold bugs or anything like that up there with them so they're kept in a very strict quarantine 
Uh, access to the crew is extremely limited in, the, in this time. And it's typically about the uh, two weeks right before they lift off. This is the same for crew members flying on a Soyuz spacecraft. It's the same uh, that we've been putting crew members for that have flown up on the SpaceX Dragon uh, in the last, uh, in the Demo-2 and the Crew-1 flights. And then once their suits were confirmed to be leak-free, we became very close to you, to the whole crew. And we are always here to support you if you need us. It's the most important thing to remember that. According to the evaluation of readiness for launch, the rocket and the boosters are in good technical condition. Everything is working nominally. And I wish you successful completion of your mission. I know you have done everything that has to be done during your preparation stage and will continue talking to you via Mission Control Center. Your program will be a little bit more full than for previous crews. You will not be bored. Hopefully, you will find some time to rest. And, of course, continue supporting each other and stay good friends. I want to wish you all the best. Um, and I want to, you to know that we're very, very proud of you, the, the whole crew, and, and, and know you'll have a great mission. It's been a pleasure watching you guys get ready for this mission. We're looking forward to seeing you on orbit, and uh, you have uh, people across the globe waiting to support you on anything you need. So thank you very much. And again, so they were able to talk to a number of folks uh, inside after confirming their suits were leak-free, uh, speaking with uh, Sergei Korsakov, a cosmonaut who was assigned to the flight up until the swap for Mark Vandehei, also speaking to uh, Dmitry Rogozin and Sergei Krikalov from Roscosmos, and Ken Bowersox and Joel Montalbano of NASA. After that, though, they were able to board their bus. That happened right at about 8.56 a.m. Friday morning in Baikonur for the ride out to Launch Pad 31. And launch pad 31 a little bit further away than Gagarin start, where uh, for years crews have launched uh, from Baikonur to the International Space Station. It took them about 70 minutes uh, to get over to the pad, crew members being helped uh, again in those Soka launch and entry suits to make their way to the rocket, head up the elevator for their ride to space.
And then once at the pad, the crew climbing a small flight of stairs, getting set up, taking a few final photos and waving goodbye uh, to officials from Roscosmos and NASA gathered to see the crew members off before they head into the elevator for the ride up to the top of the Soyuz rocket to board their capsule. This all took place about two hours ago, and since then the crew has been uh, in their seats. Uh, again, Oleg Novitsky is in the center seat. He's the commander of the Soyuz spacecraft. Uh, Pyotr Dubrov in the left seat, Mark Van de Heij in the right. Since they've been on board, they've gone through a number of pre-launch checks, uh, confirming a good leak check on the Soyuz capsule itself, also doing leak checks on their suits. Continuing to speak uh, with the pad engineers and the launch teams down in Baikonur as they continue to count down towards the launch. Back now, though, with a live view of that Soyuz, the MS-18 spacecraft, and the Soyuz rocket on the launch pad of Baikonur. And if you're just now joining us, a reminder, liftoff is scheduled at 2.42 a.m. Central Time. Uh, that's 7.42 uh, GMT or 12.42 p.m. over in Baikonur. And as of right now, we are 22 minutes and 5 seconds away from that launch. And as we continue to count down, let's first explore the Soyuz spacecraft in a little bit more detail. 10, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. The whole Soyuz spacecraft is 24 and a half feet long with an overall volume of 177 cubic feet and comprised of three modules. The descent module, situated in the middle of the Soyuz vehicle, contains customized seats for the crew members during launch, entry, and landing, and contains all the controls and displays necessary for the flight. It also houses life support systems, batteries for the re-entry and landing, and the parachute and soft landing rocket engines that slow the Soyuz just before touchdown as the spacecraft lands in Kazakhstan. There are eight hydrogen peroxide thrusters located on the module, which are used to control the spacecraft's orientation, or attitude, during the descent until parachute deployment. The descent module also contains a guidance navigation and control system used to maneuver the vehicle during the descent phase of the mission. This descent module is 7.3 feet long with a diameter of 7.1 feet and a habitable volume of 124 cubic feet. It is the only portion of the Soyuz that survives the return to Earth. The orbital module at the top is 9.8 feet long. It connects to the descent module via pressurized hatch. This is where the crew has a small amount of room to move around following launch during the flight to the space station. It has a docking mechanism, hatch, and rendezvous antennas located at the front end. The docking mechanism is used to talk with the space station, and the hatch allows entry into the orbiting complex. The rendezvous antennas are used by the automated docking system, which uses radar, to maneuver toward the station for docking. There is also a forward-looking window in the module that the crew can use to take manual measurements of distance and closing speed for those and uh, who just a laser us. rangefinder in the event of failure of the rendezvous radar system. The propulsion module houses the oxygen storage tanks, the main engine, and the attitude control thrusters, avionics, and communication and control equipment. The propulsion portion of this module handles all orbital maneuvers, including those needed for the rendezvous with the space station and the new orbit burn at the end of the spacecraft's mission. Before they are deployed, the two solar arrays are folded against the body of the propulsion module, which, along with the orbital module, separates from the descent module after the deorbit burn. The solar panels span almost 35 feet. The entire spacecraft serves not only as a crew transport vehicle to and from the space station, but also as an emergency return vehicle in the unlikely event the crew needs to leave the station unexpectedly. And we'll be going through this Soyuz spacecraft in a little bit more detail as we continue to watch it fly up to the International Space Station. For now, though, let's take a couple of moments. If you have any questions about the launch or the flight today or anything about the space station, jump onto Twitter. Use the hashtag AskNASA, and we will try and knock out as many of these as we can this morning. So let's do a few more. Uh, this first one up from Tristan. Tristan. Wanted to know what are the main things to look for in order to have a successful launch? It's a great question. Um, so this is essentially a three-stage uh, flight to orbit today. The whole thing uh, over in just under nine minutes. 
Um, we'll look for a couple of key events. I'll outline those for you real quick. So about 1 minute 54 seconds into flight, the launch escape tower will jettison. If you look at this view of the rocket, it's the very narrow part at the very top. Uh, that's in place to uh, detach and pull the capsule away from the rocket in the event there's any issue on the way uphill. That will detach at 1 minute 54 seconds, and just 4 seconds later, the first stage will separate. Now, the first stage on the Soyuz spacecraft are four strap-on boosters on the very bottom. They're firing along with the second stage for about the first two minutes into flight. Uh, shortly after that, about 30 seconds later, the launch shroud, so the uh, white part of the rocket just below the launch escape tower, that will break off, and that will unveil, essentially, the Soyuz spacecraft uh, to the vacuum of space. Um, that not, that's there to protect it. Uh, in the denser parts of Earth's atmosphere as the rocket climbs uphill. The second stage will shut down 4 minutes 37 seconds into flight, and then it'll separate uh, at 4 minutes and 48 seconds. Uh, after that, uh, uh, the lower skirt of the third stage will jettison, and that will continue to fire until just before 9 minutes into flight. And so we're really looking for all of those different staging events to take place, and then we're going to look for uh, what's called a, a good orbital insertion. Uh, that'll be the primary thing we want to hear at the very end of the ascent. All right, our next question comes uh, from Brian, who wanted to know, will the launch be occurring at the time the space station passes over the launch site like it does from the Cape? Um, it's a little bit different for this one, um, as it's timed extremely specifically in order for the Soyuz to make this uh, this kind of fast track uh, to orbit rendezvous. Um, at the time of the launch, the station will be about 259 miles over northern Uzbekistan. It'll be about 335 miles behind the Soyuz as it leaves the launch pad. Um, but then during that ascent, Space Station will actually leapfrog in front of the Soyuz during the climb to orbit. So uh, when the Soyuz launches, station will be a little bit behind it, but by the time Soyuz hits orbit, station will be a little bit in front of it. That's a great question, but it is timed extremely specifically so they can make this quick uh, to orbit about three hour, 25 minute rendezvous. Um, our next question comes from Blockbuster, wants to know, what is the docking in English time? I'm assuming you mean UTC or Greenwich Mean Time. That is a great question, and that's a, a pretty easy answer because that's the same time that we use on board the International Space Station. Uh, docking today is scheduled to take place at 11.07 and 51 seconds GMT. It's the same uh, time zone that they use on board the space station and that we follow at all of the different flight control rooms around the world just to stay in sync. Our next question comes from Nick who wanted to know which three Russian vehicles are already docked to the station and what is the station's maximum crew capacity during crew rotation? Well, there are three other Russian spacecraft currently docked to the station. Two of them are Progress or uh, Cargo spacecraft. Uh, and one is another uh, crewed vehicle. Uh, we have the Progress 75 and 77 uh, docked to uh, the Earth-facing port on Zvezda and also uh, the very aft, the very back part of station. And the Soyuz MS-17, which carried uh, Kate Rubens and her Russian cosmonaut colleagues uh, up to the space station about six months ago, is already docked. And then pretty soon um, at the Rosviet module or the mini research module number one, in about two and a half hours, or three, about three and a half hours after launch, we'll have the Soyuz MS-18 spacecraft. Uh, the most we've had before um, when we were doing these handovers uh, was about nine, and we're going to have ten uh, when we have two Soyuz spacecraft and uh, the Crew-1 Dragon attached. Uh, we'll go up to 11, and that's expected to be about the max that we'll see for these crew handover periods in the future. That'll happen anytime we do what's called a direct handover, uh, when a new crew launches and arrives at the International Space Station before another crew leaves. All right, our next question comes from Chris Davies, wants to know, is there any plans to have a Russian join a Crew Dragon flight at this stage to return the favor for the many years of Americans on Soyuz? 
Great question, Chris, and they're uh, absolutely... Uh, the frozen is, view we saw on um, the camera doesn't mean that we're waiting for the to signal fly, to come back. Uh, what we call mixed crews, so having uh, at least an American and a Russian on every okay. spacecraft going to the International Space okay. Station. Uh, the Russian okay. cosmonauts receive Fine. much more extensive training and have a lot more expertise on the Russian segment, which is functionally one half okay. of the International Space Station. Eight. And the same is true for uh, American astronauts and the U.S. segment. So to just put us in the best possible posture to continue operating the space station safely um, and just have really the best people always on hand for the job, uh, we fully intend to see our Russian counterparts join us pretty soon um, on the U.S. commercial crew vehicles uh, that are currently flying to the space station like the Crew-1 currently docked. All right, let's do one more for right now. This one comes from Dan, who wants to know, does Soyuz also use RP-1 as fuel? Does it use the same oxidizer that Falcon 9 Alone used to explorer. launch one uh, It's extremely similar. On a um, mission to reveal the grandeur of Saturn, which is just a its rings and moons. It's very commonly used uh, in a lot of rocket engines. There are some slight differences uh, between the refining process, uh, between the fuel used in the Russian spacecraft uh, and in the Falcon 9 in America, uh, but for most purposes, they're essentially the same. And they both use the same oxidizer, liquid oxygen. Uh, the RP-1 and um, the liquid oxygen is used for all three stages uh, of the Soyuz launch vehicle. Um, the Soyuz spacecraft itself uses what's called hypergol fuels, or fuels that don't need an ignition source uh, for all of its maneuvers once it reaches on orbit. That'll do it for now for our questions. If you have any more, remember to keep on getting over to Twitter. Use that hashtag, AskNASA. We'll get through a few more in the launch show, and then we'll get through a whole bunch once we're on orbit for a rendezvous and docking. But for now, continuing with our live coverage of launch, Mark Van de Heij, Oleg Novitsky, and Pyotr Dubrov to the International Space Station getting great views of the Soyuz on the launch pad and it's clear sky so should have a great view for launch today as of right now we are just 11 minutes and 11 seconds away from liftoff again that's timed for 2:42 a.m. central time 2:42 and 41 seconds to be exact 12:42 and 41 seconds over there in Baikonur the spacecraft was mated to its booster, and the three stages were joined together earlier this week on Monday. And then just 24 hours later on Tuesday, the rocket began its trek to the launch pad, taking off right at about 7 a.m. Baikonur time, then arriving less than two hours later where it was raised to its vertical position for the final pre-launch preparations. As of right now, it's poised for launch with the three crew members aboard. The Soyuz spacecraft sits high above those three different stages that we walked through a little bit earlier, which uses that kerosene or RP-1 uh, and liquid oxygen as the propellant. For now, though, why don't we take a little bit deeper dive into the Soyuz booster itself. The Soyuz rocket stands 162 feet tall, weighs about 640,000 pounds, and consists of the Soyuz spacecraft inside a protective shroud at the top and the three-stage Soyuz 2.1A booster below. The first stage has four liquid engines strapped to the side of the core vehicle. Each will burn for one minute and 58 seconds before they drop away. The core engine of the first stage also serves as the second stage and continues to burn until four minutes and 57 seconds into the flight. The third stage has a single engine that will ignite before the separation of the second stage, helping to push it away safely. It will burn until the 8 minutes and 46 seconds mark of the flight, and at that point the Soyuz spacecraft will separate from the third stage, having arrived at its preliminary orbit. And continuing to get a look at that Soyuz rocket on the pad, again launching from Site 31 at the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. We're under 10 minutes away. We're just 9 minutes, 4 seconds, 3 seconds, 2 seconds, no seconds away from launch. Continuing to march uh, towards that 2.42 uh, and 41 second a.m. Central Time, uh, 7.42 and 41 seconds GMT. So we're continuing to count down, getting very close now.
And as mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, representatives from NASA and Roscosmos are going to be watching the launch unfold as they have with all of the events so far today, just a short distance away from the launch pad over there in Baikonur. For a quick update on the activities and how everything's been going, let's go now to NASA Public Affairs Officer, the one and only, Mr. Rob Navius. Rob. As the countdown here in the Central Asian desert reaches its final minutes, we are compelled to take a look back at the historic symmetry of this flight to the International Space Station with events that transpired here 60 years ago today. On April 9, 1961, Yuri Gagarin was formally and secretly selected to become the first human to fly in space over his backup, cosmonaut German Titov. The final decision was made collectively by the iconic Sergei Korolev, the great designer, and the head of cosmonaut training at that time, Nikolai Kamanin. And 60 years ago today, the final mating of the Vostok K rocket and the Vostok 1 spacecraft took place not far from where we are at this hour, setting the stage for its rollout to the launch pad two days later. Today, here at Site 31, a more powerful Soyuz 2.1A booster stands fully fueled to send Bandahai, Novinsky, and Dubrov to a city in the sky, the orbital laboratory that is the International Space Station. On a mission to reveal the grandeur of Saturn, its rings and moons. That's it from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. Now back to you at Mission Control in Houston. After 20 years in space, NASA's Cassini spacecraft is running out of fuel. And so, to protect moons of Saturn that could have conditions suitable for life, a spectacular end has been planned for this long-lived traveler from Earth. We are just six and a half minutes away from launch, two, continuing to hear comms one, uh, between the Soviet commander, Oleg Kaminsky, and the blockhouse engineers down there we at Bike North Tower. As you can see, the crew has closed their visors. That's Novinsky on the bottom of your screen. He's in the center seat. So you in 2004, following Tom a seven-year... Pyotr Dubrov, he's in the left seat. You can essentially think of the left seat as kind of the co-pilot. We just got confirmation the launch key has been inserted. And one of potentially the coolest things in all of space flight, there is an actual physical key that is inserted and used to initiate the final launch countdown. At this point, the first and second stage engines are primed and ready for launch. Telemetry has been confirmed and received from the rocket. Again, that's going to be sending telemetry to ground sites all throughout the ride uphill, which is expected to take just under nine minutes. We're looking for third stage separation, about eight minutes and 49 seconds into flight. Combustion chamber nitrogen purge. Azbek, uh, SAC camera number one is on. We can see a flight engineer and commander. You just heard combustion chamber nitrogen purge, so they use nitrogen and inert gas uh, to flow through the combustion chamber and purge any vapors or other remnants before they start the full flow of fuel and oxidizer to the engines and using a refined version of kerosene and liquid oxygen to power all of the stages all three first second and third stages of the soyuz rocket and just as a quick reminder as we get up to the four minute mark when we launch, the space station will be flying just over northern Uzbekistan, about 335 miles behind the Soyuz spacecraft as it leaves the launch pad. And then by the time it makes the 8 minute 49 second ride into orbit, the station will have leapfrogged ahead of it, setting it up for that fast track to orbit about 3 hour and 25 minute rendezvous with the space station.
under three minutes and 20 seconds away. We're awaiting the call that the booster's fuel tanks are being pressurized for flight. This will just help optimize uh, the flow of all of the fuel to the rocket engines, helps add a little bit of structural support as well to the rocket. Oxidizing fuel drain and safety valves are closed. Ground helium of oxidizer nitrogen to the vehicle is terminated. And at this point, terminating some of the propellant feeds to the rocket. Two things to keep an eye on as we continue to count down. There are two umbilical towers, uh, really those two ground structures attached to the rocket itself. Uh, that taller one's going to separate at about 35 seconds before launch. And the smaller one, about midway up, the rocket will separate. And once you see that separate, we're 15 seconds away from launch. Booster propellant tank pressurization initiated. So there's that call out. The booster tanks are now being pressurized for flight. Again, just helping the, to optimize and facilitate the flow of fuel to those engines in the first and second stage, which will fire simultaneously to begin the initial flight into orbit under two minutes from launch. We are here for the road safety. Fifty-five seconds away from launch, we saw Oleg Novitsky there in the center seat. His flight displays are configured. Vehicle to internal power. Ground propellant seat terminated. And right at 35 seconds, the first umbilical tower separating the vehicle on internal power. We'll have auto sequence start. So the ground propellant feed to the rocket has now completely terminated. Auto sequence initiated. Second umbilical separated, 15 seconds from launch. Launch command for ignition. Please wait to now. Second umbilical tower separate. And we see booster ignition. Engines at maximum thrust. And liftoff. Soyuz MS-18 on its way to the International Space Station. Ten seconds, the booster parameters are nominal. Everything is good on board. Hearing nominal performance, the first stage delivering 930,000 pounds of thrust from those four first stage boosters and the single core engine. 30 seconds into the flight, the uh, parameters of the booster are nominal. Everything is fine on board. 40 seconds, uh, the vehicle is stable. Everything is good on board. Continuing to hear good performance calls, a quick look inside the capsule. You can see uh, the crew strapped in and monitoring displays as they continue on their way uphill. Just past the one minute mark into flight. Your and roll are nominal. Seventy seconds into the flight, everything is nominal. Uh, we are good on board. At this point, the space station has already flown over the Baikonur Cosmodrome and now making its way in front of the Soyuz spacecraft. The crew is feeling well. We're 
roughly 90 seconds into flight, the Soyuz rocket already moving more than 2,100 miles per hour, already about 10, ra 10 miles downrange. The flight of parameters of the booster are nominal. The crew is feeling well at 10 for this four unintelligible. Okay, if you received the, the message about the casual parameters, copy. And right on time, we see first stage separation, the Koryov cross, those four strap-on boosters separating. Now the single core stage continuing to power the Soyuz spacecraft into flight. Copy. Just before that, the launch escape tower was also jettisoned. Soyuz does maintain escape capability all the way to flight, though, with the stage able to use uh, for a short time uh, small boosters on the shroud itself. And then once the shroud detaches, able to use boosters on the spacecraft. Uh, so the shroud jettison is confirmed. We have controlled descent. And so we heard confirmation the launch shroud has jettisoned in this animation. You can see the Soyuz spacecraft now exposed, continuing under the power of the second stage. 180 seconds into the flight, uh, vehicle stabilization is performing nominally and the crew is feeling well, copy. Second stage is going to continue to fire until four minutes and 37 seconds into flight, so about another minute and 20 seconds. Second, the second stage uh, thrusters are functioning nominally. Everything is good on board. Getting some views from the spacecraft itself as it continues downrange. 230 seconds, vehicle stabilization is performing nominally. Everything is good on board. Aaj ka India ek cool nayi dhun dhun guna raha hai. Ek anokhi confident soch suna raha hai. Ye India apni raah par ab. What is also likely to cause controversy on the political battlefield today, Prime Minister Modi will be addressing two election meetings in Bengal today, one at 12 p.m. and then another at 3.20 p.m. 12 p.m. in Shiliguri and 3.20 p.m. in Krishnanagar. Remember, Mamta Banerjee had angrily raised the issue of Prime Minister campaigning on polling day. This happened during the third phase of polling as well, and it's going to happen today as well. Mamta Banerjee had this to say the last time the Prime Minister campaigned on polling day. And every time, every election day, Narendra Modi is used to come to Bengal and give a speech. One election day, we will be campaigning. If we, we cannot campaign in the election areas. And so we heard good confirmation. Second stage is shut down and separated. You saw a piece fly off there. That was the lower skirt of the third stage. That was jettisoned right on time, as it was supposed to. is performing nominally, and everything is good on board. So he's now being propelled by the single engine of the third stage, providing about 67,000 pounds of thrust. This is going to continue to burn for about four minutes. It's going to shut down at eight minutes and 46 seconds into flight. Into the flight, uh, the third stage is functioning nominally. Everything is good on the board. Copy, Kazbek. Three hundred and fifty seconds into the flight, uh, everything is nominal. Uh, everything is good on board. Three hundred and eighty seconds into the flight, uh, third stage structures are functioning nominally. The crew are feeling well. Copy.
Met Electron Rocket Lab's state-of-the-art all-carbon composite launch vehicle. This is a totally different way to build a rocket. Now just about two minutes left, a little under two minutes of power on the third stage. Once it shuts down and separates just a few seconds later, the Soyuz spacecraft will be flying free. And a series of pre-programmed commands will execute, deploying a number of the appendages, uh, the antennas, uh, and the solar arrays needed to power the spacecraft on its way to the station. Uh, and a number of antennas will also deploy for communications and tracking, uh, including those that will be responsible for communicating with the station as the Soyuz makes its automated rendezvous.